you, Secretary Duncan. So in the next couple of weeks, I, we're going to see the first chunk of stimulus money going out. And we're already starting to see reports of local school districts, even local governments, starting to question how states are going to use this stimulus money, particularly because it seems like some states are interested in plugging their overall budget deficit with education dollars, thereby maybe, you know, shortchanging schools. Right. How concerned are you about this trend, and what, if anything, can you do from your office? Yeah, well, this is something, obviously, we're going to watch very closely, and this is education money that's supposed to go to education, and we're going to work closely with states to make sure the right thing is done. Um, we've, we're in conversations with a number of states literally on a daily basis, and really a lot of this, I think, is sort of... Uh, uh, misinterpretation or just helping them better understand the, the intent here and so I've had some, some great great conversations um, at the end of the day is you know while we're putting out literally billions of dollars we're also holding back billions of dollars and if we see states doing things that that don't make sense and aren't in the spirit of what this is about um, they would put themselves at jeopardy at receiving that um, the, the second uh, set of money and then as you know we have unprecedented amount of the discretionary money that we're going to put out on a competitive basis through through RFPs and if states are, are doing things again that are not in the best interest of children I mean they're just very simply going to disqualify themselves and put themselves out of the running for billions of dollars so it's absolutely in states best interests, school districts best interests, and most importantly children's best interests that people do the right thing here. And um, with 50 states, there's going to be some variation. And what we want to do is not just sort of ensure that, that bad things that aren't happening, but really help to encourage great things. <laughs> and where you have states that are really using this money not just to uh, save jobs, which is critically important, but to really drive a very strong reform agenda. We want to shine a spotlight on those states. We want to really share those best practices. And this would be a real good early test for us. I've talked a lot about trying to become the department that drives innovation and scales up what works. And when we see states, we actually have some really interesting ideas already coming forward, where states are really pushing the envelope and being creative and using this, this historic amount of resources to fundamentally challenge the status quo and get dramatically better. We want to shine a spotlight on that, recognize, reward it, and uh, share those best practices with other states. There's no pride of authorship here. This is about all of us trying to get better together. Would you ever ask for money back? if you found that states didn't use it uh, in the way you think was intended? Uh, we want to be very, very clear. And if, if things are not going the way we like, you know, we're going to challenge that. But again, I'm, I'm much more interested in getting it right the first time. And um, it is absolutely in states' best interest, again, to get it right the first time. And that's, um, uh, I think everyone's coming at this with good faith. And uh, that's, that's uh, where we want to go directionally. Um, the stimulus package asks states, in order to be eligible for the stabilization funds, to make progress towards four assurances, teacher quality, assessments, standards, state data systems. Can you sketch out how the department will sort of determine whether states are making progress yeah, towards those assurances? Yeah, sure. And this is hugely important. And again, as, as you guys know, this is just this historic once-in-a-lifetime opportunity. Many other departments are getting all their, all their uh, money out the door right away, all their stimulus money, 100%. And we want, while we want to get money out fast, it's critically important that we work really smart and drive this reform agenda. And as I said earlier, simply investing in maintaining the status quo is not going to get us where we need to go, to go as a country. We want to try and get dramatically better. And so we are looking for a, a commitment to a set of reforms that many states are actually already pursuing. And these aren't our great ideas. These are great ideas that are coming from the states. But this is a real chance to take to scale what's working and help them uh, push harder than they ever have. So uh, first and foremost, we've talked a lot about college-ready, career-ready, internationally benchmark standards that we need to raise the bar that in far too many states, because the bar has lowered, been lowered due to political pressure, I would argue that we've had a race to the bottom in too many states. And we want to literally reverse that and create a race to the top. Um, so we want to really encourage states to think very, very hard about their standards. And ultimately, I think where the bar is low, we are doing children and families a great disservice, and I would go so far as to say we're lying to them, that if in a given state a child is told they are meeting standards, if I was a 
parent hearing that with my seven-year-old and my five-year-old, um, I think they're on track to be successful. And unfortunately, in many, many places, if you are quote unquote meeting standards, because that bar has been driven down so low, those children are at best, at best barely prepared to graduate from high school and totally inadequately prepared to go to a competitive uh, university, let alone graduate from that university. So first and foremost, thinking very hard about um, about those standards. Secondly, we need great assessments behind those, and that when children take a you know take a, a test in the tenth or eleventh grade, frankly, there shouldn't be any surprises there. <laughs> we should know in third grade, and fourth grade, and fifth grade, and sixth grade what students' strengths and weaknesses are. We should get real-time data to parents, to the students themselves, to teachers to say this is his strengths, this is her weaknesses, this is what they're doing well, this is what we need to do collectively to improve. And so really being able to track students um, throughout their educational career is very, very important. Um, data systems to me are at the heart of this reform effort, that we have to know uh, what the data tells us. And where we can't track students, where students get lost, how can you begin to know whether they're, they're improving or not? So we need comprehensive data systems that do three things. One, track students throughout their educational trajectory. Secondly, track students back to teachers, so we can really shine a spotlight on those teachers that are doing a phenomenal job of driving student achievement. And third, track teachers back to their schools of education, so over time we'll really understand which schools of education are adding value um, with, with, with their graduates, with their alumni. So great standards, great assessments, great data systems. Third. And, and, and you guys, you guys live and breathe this, so I'm preaching to the choir here, sorry. But um, great teaching matters. Talent matters tremendously in this work. And we want to encourage states to think very, very differently about that. Um, first, how do we recognize and reward the best and brightest? And we have literally hundreds of thousands of teachers around the country who go way beyond the call of duty every single day, who are making a phenomenal difference in students' lives in some of the toughest communities um, anywhere. We have not done enough to incent that, to reward it, to recognize it, to shine a spotlight on it, and we, want to, and we uh, have to do that. Secondly, I want to really think about how we get these best and brightest teachers to take on the toughest of assignments, whether that's inner city urban or rural. There are lots of communities that I would argue have been historically uh, poorly served and often, not, unfortunately, not just for a couple of years, but literally for decades. And there have been many disincentives for the best and brightest to take on the toughest of assignments and few incentives. And we want to really reverse that trend. Um, third, I just want to look at, we have uh, areas where we have national shortages, you know, math and science teachers, foreign language teachers. I think we should think about paying those teachers more and sort of having the marketplace um, inform us uh, uh, where our strengths are, where our weaknesses are, and where we have real shortages. Do we want to keep talking about these shortages 10 years from now and just say we're always going to have math and science teachers, or do we want to fix it? And uh, money is not the answer to, to, um, to, to that by in and of itself, but I think a little money on the table would, it would absolutely help. So it's thinking very, very differently about teachers in different ways, rewarding excellence, strongly incenting, encouraging those great teachers and those great principals to take on tough assignments in historically underserved communities. And third, uh, paying more where we have areas of critical need, shortage. And then the final reform uh, piece is really thinking about schools that are struggling, that are at the bottom of the barrel. And I want to be really clear here, I am much more interested in gains, in growth, than I am in absolute test scores. So let me just take a minute on this. Where you have a school that's been historically low performing, but it's getting better each year, rather than labeling that school a failure, which I think it does it a grave disservice and is dishonest, where schools are getting better, we need to help accelerate that rate of change. Again, we need to recognize what they're doing that's leading to that improvement, learn those lessons, and support them in doing that extraordinarily important hard work. But where you have, a, and, and I would argue many, many schools around the country are doing just that. But where you have a, a smaller number of schools that are both have absolutely low performance, but most importantly, where the growth measures, the gains are getting worse, where the schools are actually declining, I think we have to be much more tough-minded about that and do something dramatically different. That just uh, perpetuating the status quo there does children in those schools a grave disservice, and that we have to really think about turn around and turn, turning those schools around and doing it with a real sense of urgency. So that's the set of reform packages that we're going to um, states have to commit to. To, to get the money. We're going to measure their progress, their planning against these. And again, we have many states that are way ahead of the curve. You have other states that have further to go. Um, and then ultimately, 
with the race to the top dollars, and maybe we'll get into this, the $5 billion fund we have, which is trying to reverse the race to the bottom, really create a race to the top, we're going to work with a small number of states that are pushing the envelope, not in one or two or three of these reforms, but in the entire package. And we're hoping those states will literally lead the country where we need to go collectively. And those states are going to show the nation what really is possible with hard work, with political courage, and a willingness to, to challenge the, the status quo and get dramatically better. Um, I like what you had to say about turning around low performing schools. Can you elaborate on some of the strategies that you've seen that have really worked well in that direction, what you'd like to see states and, and districts do? Yeah, and this is tough, tough work, and it's, it's hard, and it's controversial, and uh, you know, obviously I had a decent amount of experience doing this in Chicago, but what we're talking about is when, again, schools are over a long period of time both absolutely low performing but not getting better and, in fact, getting worse. I think just investing more in the status quo and the same isn't going to get us where we need to go and it's not going to help those children who desperately need something better. And education, in my mind, can and is and should be the great equalizer. That you can come from the poorest of communities, from the toughest of neighborhoods, with the most dysfunctional families, but if you have great teachers, if you go to a great school, you have a world of possibility out there ahead of you. But if you don't have those opportunities, I honestly believe we as educators, we perpetuate poverty and we perpetuate the status quo and in fact ensure social failure for those very children we need to help most where we don't give the, them these dramatically better opportunities and long-term support, long-term guidance and have the highest of expectations for children um, who desperately need to be challenged and supported as they try and improve. So where we're not seeing that kind of progress, um, I think we need to come with, with new teams of adults and uh, really uh, take on the status quo and we did this over the past six years in Chicago and we saw children in schools that historically had heartbreakingly low uh, results. Those same children, same family, same socioeconomic challenges, same neighborhoods, same buildings, those same children, um, we saw dramatically better results. Some children were performing two to three times better, not two or three percent, two or three times better with a new team. So talent matters tremendously, having the highest of expectations and really building a culture where every adult in the building believes in, the, in children's potential, believes they can be successful, and is pushing unbelievably hard every day to see that happen. This is tough work. This is really hard work. Um, it's not for the faint of heart, but, but there are extraordinary education leaders who are committed to doing this, and I think we need to do more of it around the country. Uh, Secretary, you um, and the President have both talked about removing teachers who after given multiple um, kinds of professional development and support simply do not improve and are not effective with students. Um, given that state and local policies mostly dictate the removal of teachers, how do you want to move forward on that? Son? Yeah, well, again, I just think, and this is not just about teachers, this is about all of us, that unless we're all willing to think differently and work differently and behave differently, we're going to keep getting the same results. <laughs> that we have to all behave in very different ways and be willing to uh, move outside our comfort zones to get better. And let me be really clear, that starts with us in the Department of Education. You know, there's a lot of things that we want to do to, to provide dramatically better support and to really be the engine of innovation. And again, easy things for me to say. It's much harder for us to change that culture day after day after day. But can we be more than sort of this compliance-driven bureaucracy? Can we really be the, the group that's investing in what works and is taking to scale best practices around the country? So we have to challenge ourselves. Um, the president has absolutely challenged students to do more. And the line that, that in his um, address to, uh, to Congress that gave me chills is when he talked about when students drop out, they don't just give up on themselves, they're giving up on the country. I mean, that line blew me away. I mean, it's a profound thought. Um, he's challenging, he and I are challenging parents every single day that parents have to be part of the equation and they have to turn those TVs off at night and they have to be full and equal partners. Um, and we're going to challenge teachers. And you know, again, we have phenomenal teachers and we have not begun enough to celebrate them. I think the best teachers in the country are like our unsung heroes and we want to do everything we can to reward them and incent them. For teachers that are struggling, we need to help them improve. But yes, I do believe at the end of the day, if a teacher you know, is just not making it and despite help, despite support, despite mentoring, is not improving, I think we owe it to our children to make a change there. And quite frankly, it's better for the teacher to find another line of work where they can be more successful. So this is about challenge all, challenging all of us to think very, very differently, to work harder and to work smarter than ever before. Because I firmly believe that we're sort of at a point, we're, we're, at, a, we're at an inflection point. Um, this is a time of, of economic crisis. 
I've been arguing this is a time of educational crisis. It is also a time of extraordinary opportunity, historic opportunity, and we owe it to our children and we owe it to our country to push as hard as we can to get dramatically better and to do it as fast as we can. And so simply, again, simply doing what we've always done, I would argue, is a recipe for disaster. It's a recipe for maintaining a status quo that no one can be happy with. Um, not to go on too long on your question, but I, I've met with um, every governor, I've met with every state school chief, I've met with hundreds of mayors, uh, you know, talking to lots of people. The, the, the question, I, you know, urban superintendents, rural superintendents, the question I always ask at start of these meetings is which state, which district, whatever it might be, which of you feels you have a satisfactory graduation rate? Which of you feels you have conquered the dropout problem? And when I ask that question, the room gets dead silent. Lots of progress, lots of momentum, some great practices, but there isn't one place in the country we can yet point to that says their graduation rate is high enough and their dropout rate is low enough. And so again, there's a real sense of urgency that I think is throughout the country where we all recognize, we all, we all know we have to get dramatically better. To follow up on, on the, uh, the remark you made about teacher preparation programs, as you know, there are a number of new reporting requirements in the Higher Education Act for teacher prep programs. Um, but with the 98 reauthorization, we didn't see states really closing down um, programs that were poor or even doing a very good job identifying poor programs. Um, given that there are stronger requirements in the new HEA, um, will you use the bully pulpit or other um, other leverage points at your discretion to try to close down programs that don't seem to be producing very good teachers? Uh, we, we have to. We have to challenge the status quo. And again, this to me goes back to having data, that this shouldn't be my opinion or somebody's opinion. This should be our students learning. <laughs> at the end of the day, that's all that matters. That's all this is about is are we giving our children the opportunity they need. And so where you have, you have phenomenal schools of education that are producing great, great teachers every single year. And we need to, again, you know, shine a spotlight on that and help them produce more teachers and uh, su support them in their efforts. And we see places where, you know, teachers aren't making a difference and it's just not working. I think we have to challenge that status quo. I'm also a big believer in alternative certification. I think there's lots of great talent out there who wants to teach who just didn't happen to major in education when they were an 18-year-old undergrad. And the more we really, you know, open up and, and sort of remove the barriers there, I think that's very, very important. And uh, over the past uh, five years in Chicago, we brought in over 1,200 teachers who came through alternative certification ranks. And so you have programs that take folks right out of college, like Teach for America, that I think are doing a great, great job. We did a lot to bring in mid-career changers, people who are 30, 35, 40, walking away from other professions. And one of the only benefits of a really tough economy <laughs> is that teaching has never been more desirable. There's a huge amount of, of, of potential talent coming in. I also love programs that get people who are like 50, 55, 60 who are retiring and still have 10, 15 great years left and folks coming out of the military, troops to teachers programs. So they're great pools of talent that we need to continue to, to access. And the more we create some competition and have multiple pathways to come into teaching, and over time we'll figure out you know, which schools of education, which alternative, alternative certification programs are producing the best talent and keeping that talent in systems, and we need to support, some more, support more of that. So this is something we're going to watch very, very closely going forward. The final thing I'll say is I, as I led that at any time, at any time, the quality of teachers, the quality of principals matters tremendously. But I think that it matters more today than any, any time in recent history because we have a baby boomer generation that's moving towards retirement. We have an aging workforce. And over the next four, five, six years, there's going to be a tremendous turnover. And our ability to recruit the best and brightest into teaching and most importantly keep that great talent in teaching, what we do over the next four or five years is going to shape public education in our country for the next 25 or 30 years. It is absolutely a generational shift. And I'm unbelievably hopeful about uh, you know, myself, the president, the first lady, the vice president, his wife, all of us getting out, traveling the country, and really encouraging the best and brightest to come into teaching. You've heard the president talk about that. We're going to keep coming back at that. And the more we can get the, the, you know, the best talent from whatever walk of life to come into teaching, and if you really want to serve your country, if you want to do something special, if you want to make a difference, here's the way to do it. The more we can push that, the more we can get great talent in, it gives us an extra, extraordinary opportunity to literally change the face of public education uh, for years to come. Um, I'm wondering if you can talk about any changes that you're considering to the Title I regulations um, that Secretary Spellings put forward right at sort of the end of her tenure, um, particularly um, in dealing with choice um, and SES and also the graduation rate. 
uh, I can't talk too much about it. We have a set of uh, set of our recommendations coming out shortly by the end of the month, so it'll be coming. But uh, I'll just say briefly that the idea of moving kids around between schools before we offer them tutoring in their school doesn't make a lot of sense to me. And obviously, the idea of telling districts that they can't tutor children who need help doesn't quite make sense. So um, there's a lot of uh, she, a lot of things she did. That I think make you know make make great sense, and we're going to support those. There's some other places where we're going to look to be a little bit, uh, try to be a little more creative. Back to the stimulus for a follow-up. There are a couple of states that we've heard that have made uh, news because they want to reject uh, stimulus money, especially um, um, education money. Are you working with people in those states to figure out how to possibly still get some of that stimulus money into those states, or is it going to be a dead end? Uh, are? We are absolutely working with folks in those states who care passionately about their children's education. And um, there isn't a state in the country that doesn't have tremendous unmet educational need. And again, I don't think there's a state in the country that can yet honestly stand up in front of anyone or look themselves in the mirror and say our educational uh, opportunity structure, whether it's you know, early childhood, K to 12, higher ed, all the way up, is where it needs to be yet. And so we are absolutely looking to be creative and to work with people who, who have a vision and a passion for this and want to do the right thing by children. What can you do? Uh, stay tuned. Okay. Um, just to follow up on my first question about teachers, um, do you have a specific mechanism, program, funding stream, anything you would like to do in order to identify effective and ineffective teachers to either offer them rewards or encourage them to transition out? Well, uh, again, I think they're phenomenal. This is where I think my job is easy, feeling as hard as it. I don't have to come with these ideas. There are great programs out there around the country now that are identifying talent, that are rewarding that talent in different ways, that are supporting supporting that talent. And so there are many states, there are many districts that are doing really innovative things um, in, uh, I was, you know, largely in sort of smaller ways and pilot programs. And uh, what I want to do is use, again, a, a an amazing amount of dollars to really scale up those things that are making a difference. So there's no there's no, no one magic way to do this. There's lots of really interesting work out there, and we're going to follow all of that and support it and help it grow. Are there any examples you could give me so that I could you know, go look at them myself? Yeah, I mean there are lots of examples. So I don't want to say there's one. I just you know one I'm most familiar with is at, at, at home. We had started with the, the TAP model, the Teacher Advancement Project, and other states are doing that. It's a great program that um, we didn't put together. A group of the best teachers in Chicago helped put together the program. And uh, uh, it's, uh, it's still early on, but it's working very, very well. And I think it's really important, let me be clear about this, when you talk about recognizing that great talent, you don't just want to recognize individual teachers, you want to recognize entire school buildings that are doing a great job. So you want to see who that great talent is, you want to support it. I'm a big believer in real career ladders and programs like National Board Certification. I'm a big fan of that's your best teachers going back um, to school and really walking the walk about being lifelong uh, learners, not just talking the talk. But when we reward folks, you don't want to just reward individual teachers. And you, the big thing is you don't want to pit teachers against each other. That, that's a recipe for disaster. Many of these programs haven't worked because it made teachers shut down. And what you want is teachers to share, f share information. You want to look at those individual teachers, but you want to look at entire school buildings. And we created a program that rewarded not just the teachers, but it rewarded custodians, it rewarded security guards, it rewarded lunchroom attendants, it re rewarded every adult in the building where we saw dramatic improvements in student achievement. And you guys know this as you go out and visit schools in, uh, in, in tough neighborhoods where you see dramatic improvements in student achievement, it's not one great teacher. It's not one great principal. It's every adult in that building who's absolutely dedicated to helping those students be successful. And the more we build this sense of teamwork and camaraderie, the better we're going to do. Can you give us any information at all about Reading First and what your, your administration's agenda will be on the reading um, front? I mean, you know, not to, to get back into the phonics and whole language yeah. wars, but I mean, there's a lot of emphasis these, these days on background content knowledge as yeah. being essential to reading comprehension. Yeah. Well, obviously building that foundation, a love of literacy, a love of learning early on is hugely important, and uh, we'll have a lot more to talk about in April when the FY10 um, budget gets, uh, gets uh, revealed. President Obama made a very big deal about graduating from college, and of course to do that you need to graduate from high school. And NCLB um, focuses a lot on, you know, the earlier grades. Um, and, of course, we've seen a lot of talk about the importance of pre-K. 
but are we going to see anything from the president's budget or anything separately out of your office to, look, to tackle that problem of what happens in high school and how do we get more kids to graduate? Um, absolutely. And I think uh, while third grade test scores are important, I would argue they're at best a leading indicator. And if you have the best third grade test scores in the world and you're still dropping out 50% of your high school students, you're not changing students' lives. So yes, we want to look at um, you know test scores, but at the end of the day, we need to push as hard as we can to dramatically improve high school graduation rates. And to your point, um, that's the stepping stone to dramatically improve college graduation rates. And the president's drawn a line in the sand that I think is remarkable. He said by 2020, we want to go back to leading the world in the percent of our young folks, 25 to 34 year olds, who have a college degree. And that's the goal. And so we're going to work as hard as we can and hold ourselves accountable each year to make progress towards that, that goal. And again, you guys know this, but if you simply have a high school diploma, there are basically no good jobs out there for you. You have to think of some form of higher education, community college, four-year university, technical, vocational training, whatever it might be. If you drop out of high school, you're basically condemned to social failure. There are no good jobs out there if you don't have a high school diploma. And so we're going to push very, very hard to, to get here. One of the best parts of the um, uh, FYO 10 budget is dramatic expansions, and maybe we can get into this, of uh, access and affordability to higher education. That at a time when going to college has never been more important, unfortunately it's also never been more expensive, and our families have never been under more financial strain and pressure. And whether it's parents losing jobs or taking severe pay cuts, um, I worried a lot about really smart, really committed young folks who wanted to go to school but because of really tough times at home might think I can't afford or I just can't go and that would be absolutely devastating. Again, I'm just convinced the only way we get to a stronger economy is more, not less, more of our young folks go to college and graduate. So there's a historic amount of money, over 30 billion dollars going into increased access uh, to college. Increased Pell Grants dramatically, increased Perkins loans dramatically, tax credits for the, for the middle class. And uh, this to me is, you know, it's more money coming into higher education than any time since the GI Bill. It's just a, it's a staggering resource. What's also in there, which hasn't gotten as much attention, is $2.5 billion, $500 million a year for the next five years to really drive up college completion rates. And again, we have colleges like high schools, some of whom do a phenomenal job of helping young people and students who might be first generation going to college or might be English language learners, helping them not just go, but graduate. And other universities don't do enough. And we haven't created any incentives for universities to not just get students in the door, but get them out the door at the back end with that diploma, with that degree in hand. And so we've dramatically increased, or working to dramatically increase access and affordability for students, but also putting real money, $500 million a year for five years on the table to go through states, to colleges and universities, to really, again, scale up what's working, to think very differently about how we uh, drive up the attainment numbers, how we dramatically increase the number of students not just going to college, but graduating. So it's a huge, huge opportunity for us to be creative and innovative and, again, take to scale what's working. Um, staying on the topic of higher ed, um, in some states, uh, Nevada, for instance, um, they're going to be asking, I think, for a maintenance of effort waiver from the requirements that they have to fund education at a certain level in order to be eligible for some of the stimulus money for higher education, but not for K-12. Will states be able to do that under the stimulus? Will well, they be able to? We're going to look at this, and again, we're in conversations yeah. with Nevada now, and uh, we're going to look at these on a case-by-case -case basis. But again, what we want to see is we know states are making tough budget calls, and we want to make sure it's this idea of proportionality, that if education is getting cut more than other areas, well, that to me isn't good faith. That really isn't investing and doing your share of the, the hard hard work um, to, to receive our resources. But if states are, ha because of their financial situation, are having to cut across the board and education is not getting a disproportionate share of that cut, that's something that, that, that we'll uh, look at more kindly. Um, on a different topic, we're still um, waiting to hear about who will be the Deputy Secretary of Education and Under Secretary of Education. Um, if you can't give us names, <laughs> <laughs> I would understand if you can't. Um, what are you looking for in those individuals? Um, I, I, you I'll, I'll tell you exactly what I'm looking for. And uh, we have great folks who are going through the vetting process now. And uh, we're, uh, so we're. Do you have a pick? Yes. <laughs> you do. You've picked. You've made your selection. Yes. Okay. Who is it? I'm not telling you. <laughs> 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 no, we, we've. Um, I'm trying to build a really, really strong team, and what we have is um, a couple folks 
who are um, great managers. And I think, again, this is a, just an absolutely historic opportunity, this you know, $100 billion in stimulus package. But it's so important that we execute impeccably against this. It's so important that we use every dollar, not just to save jobs, but to help drive reform. And so we need great managers to help, to help lead uh, the Department of Education. Um, I also have a really strong interest on the higher education side, and particularly the community college side, which we haven't talked about. I think community colleges have been almost the uh, I don't know what the right analogy would be or metaphor. The, the stepchild of the education world are, are definitely an underutilized resource. And as you guys know, we're seeing historic numbers of folks entering community colleges, not just 18-year-olds, but 28-year-olds and 48-year-olds and 58-year-olds. And I met with a set of students uh, literally yesterday with, with the Vice President's wife, Jill, Jill Biden, from around the country. And you had grandmothers who are raising their grandchildren going back to school. It's a long way of saying that I think the community colleges can play a really, really important role uh, going forward, a huge amount of opportunity there. And that uh, as, as folks go back to retool and retrain, and whether it's green jobs or healthcare jobs or tech jobs, there's a real chance for community colleges to be uh, a hero in revitalizing the economy and getting folks back on their feet and, and into the middle class and getting good jobs. And so I want to bring in uh, folks who really understand the community college world well, who have provided great, great leadership there. So I'm looking for great managers. I'm looking for great folks on the higher ed side, particularly um, uh, on, the, on the community college side, and also folks, obviously, who are great on, on the K-12 piece as well. Um, can, you, can you describe at all what you think the role of the teachers' unions will be or should be? In some of your reform efforts, given that you know some of them, you know some some union leaders are nervous about some of the things that you've proposed in the budget and and also um, in the stimulus package. Yeah, and, and I go back to what I started before that I see tremendous leadership from from the unions, and I see a real commitment and a passion not just for their members, but very important to me, very importantly to me for children. And so as I said earlier, we're all going to have to think differently, and we're all going to have to stretch, <laughs> and we're all going to have to challenge the status quo. And what the unions have that maybe they haven't felt in the past is this is a historic, unprecedented amount of resources coming into school systems, and we are literally saving hundreds of thousands, literally hundreds of thousands of teaching jobs, great union jobs, and that's really important. And unions are going to have a seat at the table. And I'm talking with the union leaders um, virtually on a, on a weekly basis. And we are all in this together. And what I always argue, if it's just the Department of Education trying to drive changes, we're not going to get where we need to go. But if it's the union leaders, if it's the business community, if it's the philanthropic community, if we're all rallying behind our children, then we have a chance to do something very special. And we have a president and a first lady who are the embodiment of what great education can do, that we have leaders of the free world who were not born with silver spoons in their mouth, that are, are in their positions because they worked hard, because they were smart, and most importantly, because they had great teachers. And so we all have to work together and collaborate and uh, challenge each other to do the best thing for our children. And I have tremendous confidence that uh, uh, union members as well as union leaders uh, will and are part of the solution. If I'm a parent or a teacher and I want to follow a stimulus dollar all the way from the department all the way down to my local district, yeah. will I be able to do that and how, how could yeah, I do the, that? Yeah, again, there's, there's never been such transparency. And so recovery.gov is, is the website and we'll be tracking, you know, state by state you know, district by district, uh, how money is being spent. And we will be coming out shortly with a series of metrics by which we're going to be evaluating um, uh, the use of those dollars. But it is very important. And I think this is, this is where this idea of mutual accountability or mutual rec reciprocity is so important to me that what I want at the end of the day is I want our Inspector General's office to be bored. <laughs> I want them uh, to have nothing to do. This, isn't, this can't just be us policing these dollars. This has to be you guys as reporters. <laughs> it's got to be governors. It's got to be state school chiefs. It's got to be mayors. It's got to be local boards. And really importantly, it's got to be parents. And that all of us, all of us have a, a vested interest, a desperately important interest in making sure these dollars are spent well. And that where things are going well, we're going to do everything we can, again, to, to, hot, to uh, shine a spotlight on it and uh, let folks know. And we see things we don't like. We are not going to be shy <laughs> about speaking up very clearly 
very clearly and really challenge them where we're not happy. But all of us need to work together to do the right thing by our children. And if there's nothing else in our society we can agree upon, I think we can all agree that our children deserve the best. They deserve more than what we've been giving them. And this is a once in a lifetime opportunity to do it. And so all of us have to work together to make sure that uh, these dollars are well spent. There'll be legitimate, legitimate differences of opinion. It's not that everyone's going to agree on every issue. But at the end of the day, you know, waste, fraud, abuse, things that just don't help children are absolutely unacceptable. And we'll come after folks like a ton of bricks if we see that. Do you have more time? Oh, what, what time is it? I, I think <laughs> I, I, like I, 10 till 3. No, yeah. I, no I'm, 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 I'm out. Okay. So I was supposed okay. to be there at 245. Yeah. We've gone yeah. over time. Yeah. So that's, that's all right. Yeah. Yeah. you have a question here. Speaking of time, I wondered if you could talk about the role that you see a longer school day, a longer school year playing in the driving kind of improvement that you want to see in graduation and other metrics. Yeah, I think time, as I've talked about this a lot, time is hugely important. And with, with the stimulus dollars, with additional, you know, tens, you know, over $10 billion in Title I money, 10 bill, over $10 billion in IDA money, the more we can think creatively about time. And so whether it's lengthening the day, whether it's lengthening the week, uh, whether it's doing more in, in uh, this summer, upcoming now, shortening the summer. Our students, particularly low-income children, particularly students that don't have households filled with books, time is critically important. Our children are competing with jobs, with children not down the block or in the district or in the state. They're competing with children in India and China. And the fact is children in India and China are going to school 25, 30 percent more than our children here. And when I talk about a longer day, I don't just mean more of the same. I mean academic enrichment. I mean arts and sports and music and drama and debate. I mean activities for parents, GED. ESL family literacy nights and where schools truly become the centers of the community, become com literal community centers um, where families are learning together, there's this tremendous upside for our children. And I always argue that in the toughest of communities in everywhere in the country, we have schools. And at every school you have classrooms, you have computer labs, you have libraries, you have gyms, some have pools. Those buildings don't belong to me. <laughs> they don't belong to the union. They belong to the parents and the community. And the more we really think differently about how we use time, that to me is a huge lever to dramatically improve student achievement. I'd love to get every fourth, fifth, sixth grader on college campuses and have them really believe they can be part of that environment and be successful. And the amount of social isolation so many of our students experience to me scares me a lot. So I think more with the, the increased uh, dollars through the stimulus package and FYO 10 budget, and we're seeing this now. We're trying to see great, great creativity around the country of folks thinking very differently about time. And if schools are working, the obvious answer is we need to do more of that, not less. The one, the one question that I had, you talked several times about the unprecedented amount of money going into K-12 education and education in general under the stimulus. You could say to some degree the improvement you're talking about is, is all carrots and no stick. Uh, what specifically can you do to drive dramatic intervention in cases where, for example, schools are not improving despite efforts and where teachers are not improving despite efforts? What can the Ed Department do? Well, let me start at an even higher level. I talked about earlier, if you see states that really aren't committed, committed to helping children and committed to challenging the status quo and are acting in what we consider bad faith, um, we can withhold billions of dollars <laughs> from those states. So at the, the macro level, that's where you start. I also talked a lot about that we see schools that are historically low performing. Um, we need to turn them around. We need to absolutely challenge the status quo, and we need to do that very aggressively. And I also talked about where you have teachers that aren't making it, that um, they need to find another profession, and we need to help them do that. And so whether it's at the, the state level, whether it's at the district level, whether it's the school level, the individual, all of us have to hi hold ourselves to a higher standard of accountability, starting with myself. And we all have to do more. And so where we see success, we need to absolutely replicate that. But where things aren't working, we need to deal with that ab absolutely honestly and openly and do something dramatically better for those children and do something now.